for your essay, you know, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Right, so it goes like a staff chamber, isn't it? Dear, dear, dear. Yeah. They're all waiting, hungry to feed upon the carcass. So, so, Jonathan, why aren't you a liberal? Um, is it the tape going? Is it going? Yeah, this is going, yeah. Tape is going. Why aren't you a liberal? Um, well, I think basically because liberalism is not a three-dimensional view of life. I don't think it's at all deep or at all sincere. Um, the real reason is quite personal, actually, because uh, uh, my mother died when I was 16. I was insane before she died. <laughs> And it struck me that the ways in which people would talk about this and deal with anything profound or anything tragic or anything real or that punctures through the superficial mask that people wear about things in our society now was so trivial and materialistic and silly that I couldn't go along with it. And so my first views, even than the liberal sort, were a reaction against the tendentious propositions that liberalism unfolds Everything's material, all people are equal, all lives are equally important, tragedy is largely fictional, uh, grin and bear it. Um, you remember the Panglossian sort of attitude that you get in Voltaire's Candide, you know, everything's always for the best. And this sort of utterly trivial, and in one sense, irreligious attitude towards life, um, just sort of nauseated and appalled me. And I thought there has to be something better than this. And you didn't... Get in, I mean, many people who aren't liberals become communists, Marxists. Mm -hmm. You didn't uh, feel drawn towards those ideologies? No, because I've always believed in human inequality. I believe uh, human inequality is the basis of life, uh, but also the basis of morality, because I believe inequality is a moral force. Uh, the real division between the left and right is not about people who support socialised medicine or even much more sort of harsh measures, if you like, or divisive measures like even ethnicity or abortion or whatever. The real division philosophically, is those who believe that equality, enforced or otherwise, is a moral good, broadly the general left, and those who believe, and are often too frightened to say so, that inequality is a moral good, which is what the philosophical right really believes in. Even the most moderate centre-right figure, the John Majors of this world, talk about freedom, opportunity. You have opportunity, you'll have inequality, even in a market system. So, although they're frightened to mention the I word, if you like, all righteous movements, from the most moderate to the most radical, right across the spectrum, believe that inequality is inescapable, is a fact, has to be lived through, has to be dealt with, and is actually the way things should be. So the idea that you can engineer society through radical shifts or change um, so as to create more equality, to me, is completely counter-propositional. I remember Trotsky once said, um, before he teamed up with Lenin again, just prior to the Bolshevik coup, which is what it really was, that once socialism has been established, once there's a remit of equality for all at the level of material subsistence and beyond education, health and other matters, there'll be a Goethe on every street corner. He said there'll be a Kant on every street corner. There'll be a Strindberg. Notice all of these or Gentile, Caucasian cultural heroes. There'll be one of these on every street corner. And it's utter nonsense. Genius like that is against the grain. Is largely hated while it's alive by many people, but revered after it's gone. Is often, uh, these people are extraordinarily difficult for others to get a handle on while they actually exist. They're freaks of nature, and sort of special needs the other way around. The idea that such an outcome could be pre-programmed by socially enforced engineering that presses down on the difference between people rather than seeks to exalt it is completely counter-propositional. So the, idea, the moral ideas that lie behind Marxism and socialism, left democratic socialism, left liberalism and so on as you come in from the ultra-left to the centre, never interested me. Uh, anarchism, or in individualistic ideas, sort of, um, in a Nietzschean way, uh, would interest me a bit more, but the idea of the moral goodness of equality never interested me at all. So Marxism and its sadir offshoots uh, would never be for me. Although there's one area where I respect them, and that's their commitment to theory, their commitment not to debate, but to ideas, and their belief that the world can be changed. Um, and their seriousness of purpose, because all the Tories in the world are ninnies and fools. They never believed that these people were serious, they never believed that they were deadly serious, in their humorlessness, in their ranting, in their dialectic, 
in what they wanted to enforce. They were completely serious, and the sort of reactionary, quote-unquote, view that they could be laughed at and scorned, which was largely the reaction to the 60s, for example, in certain respects, has been proved to be totally false. The cultural values of such people have taken over, and people who call themselves conservative are all at sea and don't even know what's happened. You know, European countries, they have a far-right tradition, respectable far-right no, tradition. Right, yeah. Britain does not no. have this. Why, in your opinion, is this so? Um, I think there is such a tradition, but it's virtually got lost. Um, and there was nothing really to continue it. In France, you have this range of intellectuals in a very radical environment. Don't forget, these people either collaborated during the war with Vichy or did not. Um, they were either pure nationalists like Morois, who stayed in his house, and even the resistance couldn't guillotine him at the end of the war because he detested the Germans and didn't collaborate. But most of them did collaborate, and Robert Brasilach was guillotined for collaborating, and Jairus La Rochelle committed suicide for collaborating, and so on. But the intellectual tradition in France survived partly because of uh, and a greater degree of intellectual radicalism. You have a culture that teaches philosophy from the age of six, whereas most British people would be pushed to tell you what philosophy was. <laughs> Therefore, there's a degree to which you're dealing with a different sort of culturalisation. You also have, you know, extreme leftists become extreme rightists in a way that um, it's very rare in Britain. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's not an anti-intellectual or philistine culture at all. It's just it has a different attitude towards intellectuality. It privatised it a long time ago. Intellectuals do what they do over there in this little zone, and as long as they don't cause trouble, you can almost have as much freedom of speech as you want. All these laws that have been passed to prevent freedom of speech, if you put things in an abstract way, no one can touch you. But the masses don't even know what you're talking about. And so you just talk to tiny little groups on your own. But that's the definition of British intellectuality. If you look at the English-British far-right tradition, you have this range of Americans at the early part of the 20th century who come over with the new English sensibility, Canadian-born Wyndham Lewis, you have Ezra Pound, you have T.S. Eliot, they're largely literary figures. But you do have a Raven Thompson, who's a fascistic theorist, of Aaron Mosley. You have Mosley himself, who's quite a considerable theorist. You have people like Bill Hopkins after the war, who's hardly known, but he's there, and is known of inside the intelligentsia. You have the right edge of the angry young man phenomenon, which is a media-created thing, and is largely synthetic. Um, but in some ways the tradition does sort of die out there. You have Henry Williamson on either side of the war, but after him there's a gap, you see, because there's no really coherent movement. You have the emergence of revisionist historians like David Irving, that's true. David Irving's initially thought to be left-wing, of course, so Kimber published The Destruction of Dresden, because traditionally only leftists would decry allied activities in the war, you see. And that was actually quite a clever move by Irving as well. It's only later people realised the quote-unquote full horror allegedly. Um, but, yes, there is a gap. But then, of course, how many great intellectual conservatives are there? Oakeshott, Cowling, Scruton, um, a few sort of intermediate minds, a few literati, like the diarist Alan Clark. Uh, most military historians are conservative, of course, because, you know, they're slightly authoritarian psychologically and like the military. Even a, a moderate figure like Max Hastings. He's made extensive use of Irving's researches, of course, although that's not that widely known. Um, but there are enough people. It's, it's, it's not many, admittedly. You feel about a shelf uh, in terms of books, but not many. But there is a, an intellectual tradition here. If there had been a lively discourse of that sort on the edge of the Conservative Party, there probably would have been more of them. But many of them have hidden. They've denied what their views really were. Or they've gone from communism to clubland reaction like Kingsley Amos. You know, he begins as a leftist and ends as a you know a bit of a clubable bore, really. You no know, whiskey in hand, sort of Daily Mail rantings at the end. You know, but it's that's uh, intellectually, I don't believe that that's very important. It's a change of mind. I remember John Brain, the famous uh, author from the fifties, wrote a, a pamphlet called "From the Communist Party to the Monday Club," and the Monday Club used to sell it. It's one of the pamphlets I bought from them when I joined it as a very young man. From the Communist Party to the Monday Club, you see, it's a sort of, it's not, it's something, but it's not quite enough. And it's almost just a symptomatic of the fact that Brain had made it, you know, penniless writer makes it, from the north of England makes it. Um, no, it's, it's not enough. I, I put it down to fear and the jaundiced sort of palsy of um, conservatism. Conservatives are deeply, are decent people at one level, but they're afraid, they're terribly afraid, and uh, of what they're not quite sure, but they know that they're afraid enough not to wish to be unrespectable. So, of course, the next question is 
why aren't you yourself afraid? Well, I don't, know. I don't you have to ask. Uh, I don't have to do a genetic test. <laughs> oh, I'm not, but I'm uh, probably because I'm too extreme. Um, because I'm ex- uh, because I'm got sort of radical attitudes. Although there's an intensely conservative side to me, I probably am a bohemian. There's an artistic element to me. I don't care for virtual respectability. It doesn't bother me, um, and therefore. I think um, that's where the leaders of the extreme right often come from. They actually come from the arts as much as from the academy or from the intelligentsia. And the arts are a very psychologically radical part of the society. And therefore you don't care as much for, you know, being regarded as a bit of a demon. And how can we nurture more of these people? How can we nurture Um, a new radical right? By making it exciting, by making it the oppositional force in the culture. Um, by saying that it, it's no longer the left, that the left has died, that the, you know, the history man uh, caricatured by Bradbury and so on in the 70s is uh, la- based upon a particular Jewish liberal left academic called Laurie Taylor. That's dead now, all that culture, you know, marching with your fist in the air at Essex University, all that sort of stuff. It's all over now. And any energy of opposition will come from the other side. And it's true. I remember there's a bar in Maidenhead in the middle of Berkshire, and it's gone bust now but it used to be called the Soviet Bar. And you used to be able to go in there and have a Dijinsky, who was the founder of the Soviet secret police, the Cheka, have a Dijinsky. There wouldn't be a bar where you could go in and have a Himmler. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because the Soviet Union, you know, you know those posters on tube stations, you know, the masses of arms, spec saves spectacles with a red banner in the background and all this. All this Soviet iconography could be reused in the capitalist marketplace. Yeah, situationism as a theory is six, 40 years old now, where everything can be reused, it can be recycled, everything's um, absorbed into the system of 24-hour media, but there's two things that can't be absorbed. The extreme right and religious fundamentalism, as it's called, can't be absorbed. Those two can't be absorbed. And everything revolves around that. And that makes them very exciting, of course, um, sometimes for the wrong reasons. But uh, more people will come forward when it becomes the normal oppositional current. But what will change the view isn't fashionability and isn't accessibility, it's morality. Um, For a significant proportion of the generations born after the Second World War, radical right-wing positions are, they believe, instinctually immoral. And only when you break that will you, um, because that was not thought of before 39, it was uh, a dissident, but it was another political position. Um, That's not the case afterwards. And um, the reason for people not wanting to be respectable is partly moral respectability. When you break through that, you will tap the idealism that goes into green politics, that goes into anti-federalism, that goes into politics about animals and all these other um, slightly peripheral things. Uh, In some ways it's an ethical question. If you can break through that barrier, um, the idealism of the young and others is there for you. Um, but I don't think on, you'll get large numbers of people until that happens. The um, liberals, the Marxists, the enemies of the radical right, control the television, they control the movies, they control the media, they control everything worth controlling, everything that moulds the mind of the young. Mm. How do we combat this? The internet is the, is, the, uh, is the way to combat it because the internet will gradually eat all those structures and they will have to go on it in order to survive. Um, so the internet, which couldn't be stopped and is based upon American military technology from yesteryear, is um, that which will come to eat the controlling methodology which now superintends mm-hmm. media. I think there was a pop band in the 1980s called Pop Will Eat Itself and the internet is the sort of um, media devouring itself and becoming something different. Under 30 years of age, the only media they look at is the internet. They don't do, because they can see all the old media on the internet anyway. So they just go to the net, and uh, you know it's a sort of um, you can have obscure meetings with people, and it can be seen millions of times on the internet um, if you have something that is regarded as worth listening to. Now, of course, the internet contains utter trash. It's everything that's ever been the human mind's ever encompassed. So you've got the worst and the best that humans can do on it and depicted on it. But that's really just an electronic simulacrum of the human brain and its potentials for, for, for good or ill. Um, so the internet will break it and has largely done already and is, is uncontrollable. Even though, you know, the authorities can come down and they can look at what's on your hard drive, even when you don't know they're doing it, even when you're on the computer. 
because there's no secrets in that world, you see. But at the same time, it's completely broken liberal propaganda. And in the end, they, they know that. And they all look at it as well. They, uh, the, 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 I, you know, why does Melanie Phillips write about me in The Spectator? Because she knows. Because the spe spectators never go to uh, employ me to write for them, but she knows. What about ethnic politics? Would you say that all politics is ethnic? No, no. Um, yes, this is a, this is a, I remember once uh, somebody on the extreme right once said uh, that they didn't think I was a quote-unquote racist. Now, well, that's, that's old, isn't it? Because that's the worst thing you can be called in the contemporary liberal society. But my views are I'm a Nietzschean, and my views are philosophical. And race is a primary identity out of which culture comes and without which you can't sustain a civilization. But I personally believe that it is the going up from that which is rooted and that which is physical uh, that life's really about. So uh, there's always a socialism in totally racialist movements. Whereas for me, it's a hierarchy that is based upon something. A tree has roots, grows out of the ground, goes towards the sun. Um, healthy atmosphere, water on the tree and so on, grows out of the branches and a stream, and it's a healthy air plant, organism. But it's growing upwards towards something. So uh, in the end, racism and materialism. But because the whole of the liberal left consensus denies that it's foundational to create civic structure, They've, they've based societies on considerable lies. They've also opened the door to the demographic doom of their own group, in part, or in whole. And they've also made a cardinal mistake about the nature of civilization, because you will inevitably water down almost, maybe not quite, but almost to nothingness, the culture that you can create if you deny that there is a physical basis to life, but there is a physical basis to life. Like a child's born without limbs is a physical basis to life. Madness is physiological, perversion is physiological, physical excellence is physiological, beauty is physiological, people can do quite a bit with what they've got, intellect is physiological. These things are primary and are prior, and life is based upon them. Mental illness is physiological. The desire to take drugs all day is physiological, at least in part. It's socialised, it's culturalised, but there's a physical basis to it. So to deny that there's a physical basis biologically to the very nature of your own state and society is to render yourself in an impossible position. Contemporary Western leaders believe with Obama that you can have a sort of post-racial civilization. You can have an attenuated society of groups that are partly broken down, particularly around the edges, and that always minimize and deny uh, the strength and self-assertiveness of their own cultures if you deny the primal ethnicity that lies underneath it. So everyone can agree just not to differ too much so there won't be conflict, but that's not a civilization. That's just a group-based society where people paddle along and hope to avoid getting into trouble. If current trends continue in Britain, Europe and the world, where do you see society 30, 40 years from what, now? Here just in Britain or more, in Britain, more generally? In Britain and then more generally. Um, well, um, if there is no, I've always said that it will be uh, the end point, if there is an end point, and that's a debate. Uh, I don't necessarily believe life has an end point. Um, it certainly had a start, uh, and it has an end in death. Uh, social death is more difficult to determine. Nevertheless, in 40 years, on present trends, if nothing is done at all to reverse things, well, we'll have gone down with a whimper, basically. We will, have, we will be a tiny proportion, ethnically and racially, of the society. Um, Liberal mores will have taken over to such a degree that uh, large parts of the intermediate social structure, such as the family and so on, will have collapsed, will have completely collapsed. And there'll be total and utter atomization, and individuals will sort of be alone and bereft. I don't think that it can go much further. I think the liberal curve has uh, stopped and is negotiating its recession. But the point is, can other forces emerge to push it back further? So that it, everyone's managing their own decline. I think liberalism's beginning to manage the nature of its own decline um, as we speak. The point is what replaces it. And deep down, that's a matter in many ways of courage. A lot of the problems that face us are ethical, really. Do people have the courage to do things? Um, can they step out of their own lives? You see, in the past, uh, British people have been very heroic when their establishments ordered them to be. Mm. They find it very difficult to self-start. They find it very difficult to stand out. They find it very difficult to stand alone, particularly when they've caught social disapproval. 
or cultural disapproval or ideological disapproval. There seems to be uh, a great individual heroism in our group, but there seems to be an element of moral timidity and extreme conservatism and conformity. Um, and people are traumatized by liberal ideas and feel they can't stand against them. Uh, that's what political correctness is. It's just a grammar that polices people in their own mind. And most people can't get out of that. And until you break that down, other forces won't emerge. You know, many people would like to vote for the far right, but are frightened, even of voting for it. They fear that in some way they're sullied, or someone will come for them, or they'll lose their job, or people they know won't like them, and, and so on. Because a lot of politics is in the mind, and you can frighten people. And liberals are, I enjoy frightening liberals, you know, I enjoy <laughs> tormenting them, you know, and putting pins in their bottoms and watching them leap up and down and that sort of thing. It's extremely amusing. And one should play upon their fears, which are very grotesque and quite real. Liberals are very afraid of Islam, militant Islam. Yes, I know. Are they right to be so? Yes, they are, actually, because it's a sort of, a, it's illiberalism as a religion. Um, I'm slightly odd, of course, because um, I, I, I don't want the Islamification of Europe or of this country. Uh, but I admire Islam, and I'm known to be slightly dissentient on these things. They should exist in their part of the world, between Morocco and Indonesia. They have their part of the world. They basically have a sixth of the world. They should keep their block. They should keep the Amor. They should keep their potentiality. It's a different way of being human. Most Westerners can't even understand a metaphysical objectivism which is so absolute and you surrender to the slavery of God's love as the basis of the system. Most Westerners can't even you know, begin to understand what that's about, partly because they've drifted into such a degree of secularity. All religious ideas leave them slightly cold in present modernity, post-modernity. Islam is a very real threat to contemporary liberalism because they have misunderstood the nature of the multiculturalism they're trying to bring about. One, Many of the people who are flooding into the West are less liberal than the people who are here already. Two, many of them don't like quite a bit of what they see in the West. And it's not that they feel sorry for us, they feel that they were, we're a bit weak and hopeless and could be pushed aside. Um, Islam's a very right-wing, if you want to use that conception, sort of system of the world. That's why extremist Catholics converted to it after Vatican II. Some fascists and national socialists converted to it as well because it's total and absolute. It's not our way. Mm. Our civilization is based upon, in my review, a reverse principle of open-mindedness and reflexiveness and the evidentialism of which Lady Renif speaks and the Socratic tradition. Uh, I see Western civilization as primarily, but not exclusively Greco-Roman, but to me, primarily in the discourse it uses to think about itself. We begin with the view that there are certain absolutes and certain truths but we are slightly less certain of what they are and we wish to test them through life, struggle, evidence and so forth. That doesn't mean that there are no truths. It doesn't mean that there aren't things that stand outside life. What's happened is that we've become confused about our own ideas as a civilization, and that's made us autumnal. We're now in danger from other groups because we've cert we've, we're hesitant and have lost the convictions uh, which the West has been traditionally based upon. Islam's not really a threat to us, because, you, because it can't conquer the West from inside. This is my view. It can conquer the West from outside, physically, through violence, through a demographic shift, um, through militant propagandization. But the West is based on a contrary civilizational ethic, and therefore it can't conquer in here. If you notice that virtually no indigenous people, apart from radical extremists and outsiders, have any interest in it at all. It doesn't attract Westerners, it doesn't attract the Western mind. Even people who are interested in it for reasons of religious parallelism or perennialism or discourses of that sort, deep down, hardly ever convert. And if they do, they convert to Sufism, the most open-minded element of it, or they move away very quickly. So it can't come from the inside. It can only conquer from the outside. But of course, if people are weak and broken down and somebody's stronger than them, they can hold a gun over them. Mm. That is true. Mm. In what sense do you understand men and women to be different? And in what way should societal and other institutional discrimination reflect those differences? I think life uh, determines the difference. I think it's uh, biological. Male and some females have different brains. Um, therefore, wish to socialise and interact even with each other in a completely different way. Uh, deep down, almost everyone understands that. There's always a problem with the proportion of women who are completely capable of doing quite advanced male careers. Do you rip up? 
what society always was in order to facilitate this active, energetic, gifted and militant minority to get their own way. The West has decided to do that. It's made an enormous number of other people rather unhappy, um, both male and female. Seventy percent of women just want a home-based option, a man and children, despite all the ideology that goes around. But there's still 30 percent that would want something different. The Western tradition is slightly different to the Asiatic, uh, the Negroid, the Arab, uh, the Eurasian and others. Uh, women have always had more of a stake publicly in Western societies, Germanic tribes. The women often fought behind the men, but the men went first. Um, I'm opposed to feminism, but at the same time there are very gifted women who can do certain public roles. But as long as you ideologise on behalf of what deep down most men and women want, the truth is natural biology will take care of these things. You have to apply immense pressure on the society to get it to act in a counter-propositional and non-biological way. So you have to engage in intense propagandistic efforts through media to try and reverse gender roles and enforce sort of inverted stereotypes on people. If you take all of that off and allow the natural, quote unquote, political incorrectness of gender roles to proliferate, you'll find that you'll have the old MI5 chief who's a woman, you'll have the odd judge who's a woman, but broadly speaking you'll have a sort of traditional society where the roles are quite clearly male and female, and deep down no woman respects a man who doesn't think that, although they don't like him saying it. In what ways do you think that the differences between resistance to cultural and political Marxism in the United States and Canada and resistance to cultural and political Marxism in Europe will manifest themselves over the course of the remainder of this century? Um, that's an interesting one. I think in a strange way they'll take the same form whether the societies are in quite different stages of development. Um, I, I think um, uh, America's difficult and America's in a more radical state. It's, it's further into decline but there's bigger space. Um, there's more chance of a sort of moral rightist resurgence there. Um, there's, there's a lot of energy there. Um, Europe's quite tired, I think, and needs to wake up quite quickly, but can. Um, yes, that's an interesting one. I think the great difficulty in America is a third political force. Uh, if things emerge in America, it will be ideological. Many of the various right-wing books in the 20th century in English have been written by Americans. People like Revelo P. Oki, uh, uh, Revelo P. Oliver, Yoki, Lawrence R. Brown. Um, they've contributed quite a lot, and yet their movements have almost been completely marginal. But then you can, 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 just by adopting a coherent form of thinking, you can actually change reality quite a bit. Um, but white people essentially come from Europe, and their destiny deep down is in Europe. And therefore, Europe is ultimately more important. And... I think the intellectual tradition here is richer and stronger, um, and the political tradition in some ways, even uh, against liberalism, is more robust. Um, so I think that um, some of the ideas that a successful breakout in Europe may use will come from America, but I think America's in, destiny is in Americans' hands. I think the greatest thing America can do is to foster neo-isolationism in the middle and the end of the 20th century. If America turns back on, on itself, the rest of the world will be liberated from its thrall, and there is a prospect for a European uh, uh, rebirth. Could you just briefly explain what sort of paganism, paganism it is that you represent, and how, if at all, it is distinguished from other so-called pagan movements such as Wicca? Yes. Yes, that's a very good question. It's essentially truthful because most people know in their hearts that those who describe themselves as pagans are prone to be like that. That university experience is probably a little quote-unquote extreme, but broadly speaking it's morally true um, as an essay in discovery. Um, my view is quite simple. Paganism and Christianity are the wrong way around. Um, Christianity is... Uh, influenced our culture for 2,000 years. Christianity has provided the ethical and aesthetic superstructures through which most Western people think. Reality is pagan, man is pagan, nature is pagan. Uh, pagans have reacted against Christianity, which is deep down a quote-unquote left-wing religion of humanism, love and tolerance, um, in an aggressive, leftist and alternative way. Contemporary pagans believe that Christians are conservative, that they're staffy, that they stand for daily mail and family concentric values. They will rebel against that in every respect. 
and Christians think of pagans as woolly, alternative leftists who want to tear things down. In actual fact, paganism is pre-Christian, is barbaric, is natural law oriented, is is uh, morality is morally fascistic. Um, however, pagans would scream, would scream and scream and scream at the idea of that, and would run from the room. And Christianity is a religion of tolerance, love, and peace. So they're the wrong way round. They're completely the wrong way round, and in their full symmetry or asymmetry, they indicate everything that's happened. That um, and it's a sort of um, it's the part of the generalised tragedy. You know, most a lot of Christian people are quite those that are remain a bit residual, residually patriotic, and so on are quite right wing. A lot of pagans are beyond the Guardian, and the two are the wrong way round. The reason why Christianity has had such unbelievable influence on our culture to the degree that I'm not, uh, not anti-Christian in the sense of culturally disavowing it because you, just, you cut off 70% of the way in which the West achieves what it is. It can't be done and shouldn't be attempted, in my view. The change is ethical. Everyone's a pagan, really. If somebody pushes you, you push them back. The Catholic school I went to had a lovely little chap who taught piano. And he said to me, why is there so much bullying in this school? He said, this is a Catholic school, this is a Christian school. Every day I go in, the boys are bullying each other. I saw a boy with his blazer over his head and another boy was booting him, booting him in the playground. He was quite morally shocked. He was genuinely morally a Christian man, which very few people are. And I respected him for that because it is a conceptual and an ethical and a spiritual viewpoint. Hardly any Christians are really like that. It's a cultural label that they've adopted, that I was born into, that everyone in the West was born into at one time or other. And um, I said to him, because human nature is like the way that they are. It's a male male school, they're fighting violently amongst each other for hierarchy and supremacy, and it's a test. And he said, but that's terrible. He said, that's horrible. That means that we're not that much beyond a guerrilla colony. And I said, that's life. You have an ideal about how it should be but it's not how it is. And so these pagans are sort of worse than a travesty, really. You know, it's a, it's, it, is, it is ridiculous. Although some of their truths, um, that good and evil go together, that reality is non-dualist, that nature dominates life, that nature has a sacred dimension, those are actually true. But essentially, you're, you've got the leavings and the cultural spastics and that sort of thing all gathered together in one area. Uh, whereas paganism is really about strength and morality, and uh, growing towards the sun. And it's not, you don't have to believe in gods and goddesses, they're just the personification of those forces. You don't want to take a break? No, yeah, I've exhausted you, have you? I've beaten <laughs> down your questions to the degree you can't take any more. You know. Um, well, some more often than always. Questions. I never write my speech till I stand up. Which is very do, good, how actually. How do you do that? How do you just... Um... You must have some sort of ideas, though. I do, but I sort of, um, but I like performing, so it's not an effort for me. Although it, 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 it today tired me. Today was quite a performance, because I was sort of performing, you know. Mm. Uh, in the performance, it was a sort of performance of a performance, so it was a bit, uh, you know, I felt sort of, but after you do, but I like doing it, you know, I mean, I like doing it. I don't have to do it. Mm. I'm not one of those pathetic performers, because actors and performers are two types. They're, they're sadists or masochists, really, and I'm a sadist, you see? <laughs> so as most performers are masochists, um, they're on pills, they, and everyone must love them. Mm -hmm. If they have a boo in the audience, they're prostrated for a day, and all this sort of thing. They reinvent themselves each time they go before the camera. Whereas the other polarity is Orson Welles, you know, egomaniac. He believes the world must look at him and so on, and I'm like that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you actually six coffees start yeah. off with oh, something? Tea? No. no, in the head, and then you build on from that. Well, I know I'm going to talk yeah. about Punch and Judy, but otherwise yeah, I have. I don't so. really know. I know some of the skits. Some of the Jewish comedians would call it shtick. The yeah. sort of stuff you come out with. I know because there are routines. Punches on the ground, and the crocodiles eating him, and the doctor comes up. Yeah. I know those routines, and I'll fit them in somewhere. So no, I don't know what I'm going to do. No, you just get up and do it. I just get up and do it. It's um. But it's sort of, uh, but I like doing it. You see, it's natural for me to do it. Yeah, I don't, it's it's natural, sort of fun. It? Whereas most people, they would <laughs> literally be. They talk about oh, it's nothing. I could do it. They get up there. They'd be utterly terrified. I've seen, say, I've seen BMP organisers, great hulking blokes who take you apart. Mm. 
I says a bloke I remember in some Essex meeting, some bikers meeting, they're almost chanting in there, you know. I sometimes think, you know, my father's a very sort of posh bank manager. And I'm here in this meeting, I've spoken in some utter dens, you know, in pits. I've spoken in one place in Burnley with barbed wire all over the meeting. And the, I said to the organizer, Why is there so much barbed wire over the over the sort of the meeting place? And he said, It's to keep the school march on Right, but he didn't tell me which which part of the population he was referring to. Mm -hmm. um, shutters on the windows, you know, and uh, there was one she-bean of a place in South London, Merton or something I spoke yeah, at. Good Lord, it was sort of, you know, sort of, yeah, he's right, you know, some bloke would get up and say, you know what I mean, I, and the other bloke would say, I don't agree with that, mate, I think you need sorting out. And they'd almost be fighting in the middle of the meeting, and the organiser would go down and sort of kick them like a dog. He actually dragged one bloke out, hitched him up. You better turn this off, actually. Hitched him up and threw him out of the meeting, saying, get out. You know, you're getting out, boy. You know, it's, it's a beer cellar, you know. It's sort of semi-uncontrollable. And yet, you do have a power over them. They listen to you. It's interesting. Because, you know, there's a few heavies there, like Steve and so on, you know, but there's a sort of, there's, you know, if it, but they have a sort of admiration for you, in a way, because they... they they want you to say what they can't, that's what it boils down to. Vocabulary. Yes, and, uh, and they admire you for it as well, because there's, sort of, there's also a class love-hate relationship as well, you know, because they sort of, so the part of them doesn't like you, and a part of them adores you, and it sort of vies, the one vies with the other, you know? Um, but then patriotism's the only socialism, really, because it holds people together in their difference, because people are different. This is a follow-up question from the last uh, mm. question about paganism. Uh, it's very simple. Is uh, when did you decide to convert to paganism and why? Well, I never really converted to paganism. I mean, there are some orthodox pagans, if you can have such a thing. You probably think, oh, I'm not one. Um, but uh, I'm a Nietzschean, and that's a different system. Somebody made this for me, and I like Odinic paganism sort of uh, as an objectification for my thought of sensibility. Um, does one believe the gods objectively exist in another realm? Well, um, the value, you see, religion is a, is a philosophy about life which is sacristic and has rituals in which you partly act out. Therefore, it's just more important because it's made more, slightly more concrete than ideas, although it's really just based upon ideas. Um, and there are relatively powerful but simple ideas at the crux of all the big religious systems. Most people are born in a system and just accept that and go along with it, as long as it's not too onerous or they feel they can live their life through it properly. Um, I just agree with the ethics of that type of um, Nordic paganism, which is really how the Vikings lived and how they behaved. Um, I'm less concerned with small groups, which I respect, like the Odinic Rite, but uh, I personally believe that those sorts of things will only ever activate postmodern minorities and very small <coughs> ones at that. But no, it's, uh, I think people should identify with what they think that they are and that their value and the values that they hold. This symbol really means um, strength, or courage, or masculinity, or the first man, or the first principle of war, or the metaphysics of conflict. Um, so I just think it's a, it's a positive system of value. Um, I never really was a Christian. Uh, culturally, I've got great admiration for elements of Christian art, more so than most people who are pagan who have violently reacted against it. I don't really share that emotionalism, but I don't agree with Christian ethics. I think uh, deep down they've ruined the West and we're only in the state that we are because of them. How do you work, view the works of Julius Evola? Yes, they're the counterbalance to the Nietzsche. Transcendental elements. Yes, and he's sort of, yes, that's, um, there's a lot of religious elements in there of a perennialist sort that a lot of modern minds can't accept. You see, Nietzsche's a switchblade. Uh, Nietzsche, nearly all people in this society are modern, mm. even if they think they're not. Nietzsche is a modern thinker. Nietzsche is a modernist. Nietzsche can reach the modern mind. Nietzsche is the most right-wing formulation within the modern mind that people can accept. I think if they ever come to somebody like... People, on my view is that people who accept Ebola straight out aren't living in the modern world. That's not a criticism, it's a description of what they're, where they are. I think if people are to, to, to sort of um, be, become illiberal, they have to become illiberal first within the modern world. 
And some people would say you've got to go outside of it, you know, the culture of the ruins and the revolt against the modern world, et per se. But I personally think that we're in modernity, and therefore we've... Um, uh, but there will be people who, who go to Nietzsche and uh, thus begs Zarathustra, which is really a semi or pseudo religious text, mm. is not enough. And they'll want to go beyond that, and they'll want a degree and a tier of, of religiosity. And the dilemma always in the West is what to choose back to Christianity or on to paganism? Which system do you choose? Uh, Evelyn said he was a Catholic pagan, didn't he? And, Something like that. And yeah. uh, one knows what he means. Because, of course, you see, but I see paganism peeping out of everything. I see paganism peeping out of Protestantism, the most Jewish form of Christianity, um, through its power individualism and its extremist individuality, Kierkegaard, Carlyle, Nietzsche. Um, I see paganism saturating Catholicism and peeping out of it at every turn, aesthetically, artistically, the art of the Renaissance, the return of the Greco-Roman sensibility, the humanism of the ancient world. Um, some of the greatest classicists were medieval popes. And so, and I see it just looming out of the whole structure of the Catholic Church as a Roman imperial structure, Christianized. So I see it peeping out that our law is Roman. Um, all our leaders were educated and steeped in the classical world to provide a dialectical corollary to Christianity without them being told that's what was happening. Um, the decline of the classics is partly because people don't want to go back there basically so you don't teach it to anyone apart from tiny little public school elites which are what two percent two percent to naught point two percent of the population we've read a few authors that no one else even knows exist you know big deal um so so yes it's um uh, the difficulty with Evola is that um it's a very great leap for the modern mind. Although in his sensibility, I, I agree with his sensibility, really. You know, I agree with him going out amidst the bombing, you know, and not caring. You know, I agree with that sort of attitude towards life, which is an aristocratic attitude towards life. But we're living in a sort of, you know, a junk food, sort of liberal, low middle class society. Um, I think you've got to sort of start where you are. Mm. And um, I think Nietzsche is strong enough meat for most people, and he's far, far, far too strong for 80% now. I mean, today, um, the mentally disabled have been allowed into the Paralympics, so we will have the 100-yard cerebral palsy dash at the next Olympics in London in 2012. <laughs> this is the world we're living in. And Nietzsche would say that's ridiculous and so on, and that is a shocking and transgressive and morally ugly attitude from the contemporary news that we see. So it's almost as if sort of Nietzsche's tough enough, you know, for this moment. Um, but I'm interested, he said God is dead in the minds of men. That doesn't necessarily mean, of course, that, although he was a militant atheist, he's leaving open the idea that, you see, the Christian idea of God was dying around him mentally, and it has died. I mean, hardly anyone really deep down believes that now. Even the people who say that they do don't in the way that they did a hundred years ago, or their predecessors did. So it has died. But I think there are metaphysically objectivist standards outside life. Whether our civilization can revive without a return to them is very, is very open, it's very questionable. But where that discourse is to come from um, is it's sort of... Um, the tragedy would be if Christianity sort of facilitated our greatness but ended up ruining us, mm. which of course is, might be the true thesis, of course. You know, you've turned the thing around and the right will only defeat the left and the centre if it's more creative, more energetic, more radical, more intelligent, more sassy, or cooler. That's the only way it will win. And the trouble with right-wing people, on the whole, is they're sort of pessimistic and they, they are slightly unimaginative. And they're people, they're deeply conservative people. They're very decent people, but they're conservative. You've got to be more radical than that. And I'm, you know, I'm a very conservative person, but I'm also a revolutionary. I think you need the two combined, you see. That's why I call myself a revolutionary conservative, which most people think, what is he talking about, you know? Um, but uh, it's actually true, that's what I am, really. Um, and the irony is, uh, when I was in Griffin's party, uh, I was by far one of the most right-wing people in it, and that's not a stupid statement at all. 
and it was odd actually. It sort of went from extreme Tory because uh, when I turned up, many of them thought I'd be a, an ultra reactionary in their terms. You see, and I ended up sort of a very much almost almost an ultra in that party, but in a different way to the others because they just judge it as the civic nationalist, the populist, and the nativist, and the fascist. That's the range within the party, if one speaks honestly. And I didn't entirely fit into all any of those categories, actually, but um, uh, I think it's good not to. Why do, do people always want to fit into these characters, these, these boxes that people have marked before they even turned up? I don't see the purpose of all that. You've got to find new synthesis, new ways of doing things, new ways of acting and thinking. And the right did that, you see. It was a totally alternative current from... 1880 onwards till about 1920. It was also a countercultural current. The whole of the countercultural in mid Europe was on that side then. Mm. The counterculture we understand now is the one that we're fed into the 60s. And the gradual movement through the institutions of the Blair generation is the 60s coming to power. Greg Dyke at the BBC, Blair in government. It had all been prefigured by people before, but that's the key generation. They're people who are 60 now who were 20 when it was all kicking off, you know, in the early 1960s, this sort of stuff. A bit different, you know, but that sort of range of age. Brown's right at the end of it, the age terms. There are younger people still in the cabinet and seeking to replace them, but from other parties. But the 60s revolution is a cultural revolution, not really an economic one. It's a cultural and social revolution, and it has to be reversed or changed. The energy can be taken and changed and moved in a new direction, you see. Um, everything's about energy. Mastery, control it, and you can control the world. Probably a good moment to stop, actually. <laughs> what, what time is it now? 10 to 11. Oh, Lord. Yes, we've got to get bound.